This is the City of Wapaka, first Tuesday of the month, City Council meeting. Let's explain what's going on tonight here, just so we know we have a little bit more uh, people from the public and also from the press tonight. So we actually have two public hearings that we are going to have before the City Council meeting begins, and we're obviously behind a few minutes by... And as you all probably know me, I, I like to be punctual and we're just a little bit behind here. Uh, the first resolution has to do with uh, the Franklin Street right away and we're going to uh, uh, discontinue the use of that right away since we never used it to begin with. So uh, we'll begin that public hearing. I'll call that meeting to order, uh, public hearing to order at 6.04 p.m. Um, in attendance, um, Council members, uh, Sandy, do this real quick for us. All right, Brian Smith here. Steve Hackett here. Lori Chestnut here. Paul Hagen here. Alan Keeland here. Zach Brachatsky here. Dave Peterson here. Paul Mayo here. Dimitri Martin here. Very very fair here. And Eric Olson here. Ten present. We have a quorum. We got them all. Uh, next up, then, uh, let's have uh, Justin just explain the purpose of this hearing for us. So this is the discontinuation of Franklin Street and an alleyway from Granite Street up to Pleasant Street. Uh, this is the um, second reading or the adoption is tonight. Uh, this was discovered or we came upon this doing our Granite Street project uh, where we have this right away there of a block of Franklin Street and alleyway. Uh, believed not to be improved because of the underlying bedrock. We have utilities that circle the block around each side servicing all the properties in that area. So further improvements to these sections of right of way uh, would not be cost effective and we don't believe the city would ever utilize that. Uh, so seeing that this right away has no value to serve the general public is why I move forward with vacating these sections of the right of way. Uh, the Excuse me, the um, legal description is in your packet uh, showing the parts that we're looking to vacate. Uh, there was an aerial showing the areas in the last description. I did not transfer over to this one. If you'd like to see that, I can give that to you anytime. All right. Uh, thank you, Justin. So at this time, uh, we would take uh, public comment and testimony in favor of the resolution to discontinue Franklin Street from uh, Granite Street to Pleasant, Pleasant Street. So anybody that would like to give testimony in favor, please step up to the podium, give your name and address for the record, limit your discussion to three minutes or less. Anybody that would like to make testimony in favor? Uh, hearing none, seeing none, we'll move on to testimony in opposition. Do we have any testimony in opposition? of this resolution. Any testimony, Any testimony in opposition? I, I, so, so at our council meeting tonight, uh, we will be acting on this resolution and voting on that resolution tonight. Let it be known that uh, we had uh, nobody, either testimony in favor or in opposition at this public hearing. And we are closing this hearing at 6.07 p.m. All right, uh, the other hearing. The other hearing has to do with the mask uh, resolution that is on your agenda tonight. Uh, we asked for a public input on this, and uh, we are calling this a hearing to order. Um, and... Uh, we still have uh, all 11 council members in attendance, the mayor and the 10 council members in attendance for this meeting tonight. Um, and uh, this has to, the, the purpose of this hearing is to hear uh, what your thoughts are on the wearing of a mask uh, in the city limits of Opaca. So we kind of changed how we were gonna do the public input tonight. Uh, we're going to ask the individuals that are in the library meeting room to actually come into the council chambers and step up to the podium and, and speak to us directly in front of us. So we'll use the chief uh, to bring them in on an individual basis. 
So, uh, Brian, whoever wants to go first. And those of you that are listening, this is public input. You must give your name and address for the record, and your discussion cannot last more than three minutes. Uh, I, I'm uh, Russ Butkowitz, uh, 124 East Lake Street, Wapaka. Um, I'm one of the local physicians. Uh, thank you, Council, for letting me uh, speak tonight. Um, I come to you before you tonight in support of a mask resolution, a mask ordinance. Um, um, I want you to just see what it is that I wear uh, every day. Uh, to protect myself and to protect my patients. Um, this is actually the very minimum protective gear that I would wear uh, as I'm seeing patients. Um, we have had uh, increasing numbers of cases. We've had uh, increasing uh, test positive. Uh, our numbers are rising. Uh, I am very grateful for the governor's mask ordinance. Um, but I also uh, recognize that there are there are people that are in opposition uh, that this may not be something that lasts. Uh, the uh, legislature has said they may they may vote to rescind this, and uh, that that it may need to fall to local communities to decide uh, how they're going to handle this. Um, I've written, I've written several letters. Uh, I think some of my partners have also written letters. Um, partly what I wanted to tell you is that as we're going forward, um, we are seeing uh, I, right now we have three of our providers are out due to contact with COVID positive family members. So they're unable to work. Um, this puts us in a terrible bind in terms of having the physical staff to take care of people. We also have uh, we have three different methods of testing people for for coronavirus. One of which is we don't have supplies for, so we're down to two. Uh, one of which is a send out, so our testing is limited, and we're not even to flu season yet. Um, so I would, I would plead with you to endorse a, a mask resolution, a mask ordinance, because it is one of the very effective, simple ways that we can help to try and limit virus spread. And our healthcare community needs all the help we can get. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Uh, just a reminder, as we bring in the next individual uh, person, uh, this is a time for the residents to give their public input. Uh, this is not a question and answer type setup here, so they'll just be giving their public input. We'll have to, we'll have to do it like baseball. You're up. Who's on deck? <laughs> Hi. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Savannah Fredrickson and I live on Maple Street. Do I need to give my address? That's good. That's good enough. 115 Maple Street. Okay. Um, I appreciate what the doctor said, but as a community member, my opinion is to not have it. 
And these, and these are my reasons, because, because I, feel like I feel like you're pressing, pressing things, on things on people, and, and as, hard as hard as you try, as you try it, doesn't, it doesn't, it kind, it kind of matters, but it really, it really doesn't, doesn't matter, that matter that much, because even just, even just from the time I've been here, been here I've, touched I've touched the same door, door handle all of you, all of you touched. Multiple, multiple people, people from this room have been in that room. And, and I'm not, I'm not no, disrespect no disrespect to you, Mayor, but your mask, your mask wasn't even over your nose when you came in there. And, and like, the gentleman, the gentleman that escorted me in here, his mask was kind of broken. And, and my point being, you can, you can do, you can make a mandate or ordinance or whatever, but people are still touching everything and they're doing these things. And I think, I think the kids, the kids going, going to schools, schools and especially, especially I think of like kids in, kids in daycare and they're, and they're there for 12 hours a day and, and who are they looking at? They're looking, they're looking at this. And I, and I don't think that some, that some people, people like, teachers like teachers and daycare workers especially shouldn't be forced to wear masks because, because I think kids growing up, up especially children, children shouldn't, shouldn't be forced, be forced to, wear to wear these masks. So, so that is, that is my opinion, opinion and, I and I hope as a community member, you will take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Savannah. Th th actually, thank you for coming tonight. Yes. Appreciate it. I do want to correct you, though. I, my uh, mask has been over my nose the whole time. It might slip down as I talk, but I pull it back up as quick as I can. All right, next up. Just have to give people credit just for coming. You see how nervous she was? Just to. She called me today. Yeah. Exactly. Go ahead, stand right at that podium there. How are you tonight, are you tonight sir? I'm, I'm talking right here, sorry. How are you tonight? I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you. Can you give your name and address for the record, please? Uh, my name is Leonard Sheard. I live at 910 Mead Drive, Wapaka, right. Wisconsin. Thank you, Leonard. Go ahead and give us your comments. Um, Dimitri had sent out uh, an email, I'm guessing to probably all of his constituents, uh, announcing that this meeting was going to cover the subject of the mask. And uh, it's something that I've been following for some time and uh, have some very strong feelings about, which I expressed in an email to him. And I'm guessing he probably forwarded that to pretty much everybody. In that email, um, I have copy and pasted a number of different articles that appeared all the way from I think, I think probably March of this, of this year up to just maybe, maybe either yesterday or today, the most recent one that I found. And essentially, and essentially as I said, at the, at the end of that email, other than, other than my editorial comments, um, a resolution or ordinance mandating mass will accomplish nothing but making a few people feel warm and fuzzy, but how the heck do you plan to enforce it? Will you throw me in jail if I refuse to pay the fine? Is it that important to add another regulation on top of the one that the state or county may be issuing? And so my point is, this has already been addressed by the state. And I'm assuming that the state has precedence over pretty much anything that the city might pass. And uh, I, strongly I strongly feel that they ought to go with what the state, what the state is issuing and have, and have it debated there and taken care of. Personally, Personally um, I, think I think that this issue of the COVID-19 virus, which started out as the Chinese virus, which graduated to the Wuhan virus, which graduated through a number of different names just because people got upset as to what it was being called, and now it's a SARS variety of some kind as well. That is, that is, it's been politicized way beyond 
um, what, can what can be considered science. science. And, for and for a long time, I have been of the, been of the opinion, opinion, I'm going to say, that science, that science is no more than the knowledge I have right at this moment. At this, at this moment, moment now, after, after it passed for a second, it has changed. It has changed. And, the and the knowledge that we had then can be countered. countered, countered. It, can be it can be called wrong, wrong or it can be confirming, confirming what we thought we knew. And the, and the problem with this idea, idea of that science is backing up either the wearing of the mask or science is saying that we shouldn't wear a mask, um, I, think I think is a big error in the minds, in the minds of people that use that as a threat, as a threat to, shout to shout people down. And it's, and it's effective in some areas. But if you look, but if you look at it, all the, all the science that we're quoting in the news media today, whether it's related to climate, whether it's related to disease, whether it's related to race problems in this country, it all changes. And it changes very quickly in some of those issues. So I ask you, drop this subject before it becomes a real thorn in the side of the city with people that are not going to follow it. And uh, it's just it's going to cause a, problem, cause a problem, for problem for your enforcement agencies. Thank you. For Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Leonard. Thanks. Thanks for coming tonight. I, I, I do want again. I, I I want to take this opportunity to just correct one thing that he said. It is true as the, as what we have for a resolution tonight. If we pass that, the governor's order would be more restrictive than what our resolution is. The governor did say in his order, though, that cities could be more restrictive than the state uh, order. Uh, this, in this case, that's not true. So we would have to follow the state order if we were to just pass this resolution tonight. I'm just trying to fill in a little bit here <laughs> as we go forward. Uh, and, and those of you that are watching this in, from the public, and those of you that are here tonight giving public input as well as council members and uh, we have been inundated with emails and uh, we are and i can only speak for myself but i hope that all of our our council members are taking all of those emails into consideration even though we are not going to read all those emails into the record we have someone coming here chief no that's all that's all Okay. okay. All right. All right. So we ended up doing testimony in favor of and testimony in opposition at the same time here. So I'll just declare this hearing uh, closed at uh, 621 p.m. And we'll go ahead and go right into our council meeting. Give me one second here and Sandy a second here to make sure that we're all set. All right, uh, welcome everybody to our regular scheduled city council meeting tonight. Uh, we had two public hearings and that's why we're on a little bit late tonight at 6.22 p.m. And I call this meeting to order and let's begin as always with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Okay. Give me just one minute here, will you? Sorry for being secretive. You'll understand in a minute here. Okay, okay. Uh, so we have a clerk's open meeting statement. This meeting and all other meetings of the Common Council are open to the public. Proper notice has been posted and given to the media in accordance with Wisconsin state statutes, so the citizens may be aware of the time, place, and agenda of this meeting. 
And uh, take roll for us again, Cindy. Frank Smith. Here. Here. Steve Hackett. Here. Here. Lori Chestnut. Here. Here. Paul Hagen. Here. Alan Keeland. Here. Scott Prochatsky. Here. Dave Peterson. Here. Paul Mayo. Here. Dimitri Martin. Here. Here. Mary, Mary Fair. Here. And Derek Olson. Here. Ten present. We have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Okay. Okay. Next up, you have the consent agenda. Sandy tells me that we have no additions to that. All of these items that you see on the consent agenda are items that you will vote on with one motion. Uh, if you would like to see any of these items move to the regular agenda when you're, where you discuss them uh, individually, this is the time to let us know, let me know that you would like to see them on the regular agenda. Uh, if there are no changes to that, then I would look for a motion to approve the consent agenda as printed. Move to approve. Second. 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 Motion by Olson, second by Chestnut, that we approve the consent agenda as printed. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against. Motion carried. All right. Uh, next up, uh, you have the regular agenda. I am asking for one change on the regular agenda. Uh, you have uh, number seven is non-agenda and announcements. Is, is number seven and unfinished business is number eight. I'm asking that you switch those around. So we're going to do unfinished first as number seven, which is the next item after the reg approving the agenda. And then we'll do the non-agenda items and the announcements uh, after the unfinished business. If you're, okay if you're okay with that, I uh, would need a motion to approve. I'll move to approve the agenda as amended. Motion by Peterson. Second. second. I, I, who is the second? I'm sorry. Uh, Lori. Uh, to approve the regular agenda with that, with that one change. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? A motion carried. All right, so unfinished business. Uh, this is actually part of the public hearing that was held tonight. It's uh, resolution number, and it has a number now tonight, resolution number 1464. This is an emergency face covering requirement during COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Aaron, do you want to just set this up for us and what they have in their packet, please? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mayor Smith. Uh, so as we know, uh, we had a discussion a couple weeks ago as a council um, after Alderman Keelan brought forward the prospect of um, a requirement of face masks to be worn within the city. The result of that conversation was, as it's shown in your packet on page 67, resolution number 1464. Um, we tried to take everything basically into account that uh, existed in our conversation as a council uh, a couple weeks ago, and we had worked on this. We drafted it. Uh, I know Mayor Smith, myself, um, Tom, um, and other legal counsel uh, drafted this as a result of those conversations. Um, and you guys have all had a chance to, to look at it within your packets. Now, as Mayor Smith said during the public hearing, uh, this is a little different circumstance than we thought we might be in here just because of the order from the state or from Governor Evers. Um, if this was passed and acted on and uh, from council tonight, it would still be under the state order. As Mayor Smith said, this is less restrictive than the state order. Um, one thing to take uh, into account and I think can, will be a part of the discussion is if the state order uh, was not in place anymore, then it would fall back on this resolution. Uh, so that's kind of what we're here to discuss tonight. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that result as a dis council discussion, and we can move forward from there. Okay, so um, based on, I'm not sure how much discussion we're actually going to have tonight, but uh, again, uh, uh, we have people that, uh, council members that are virtually attending this meeting tonight, and we also have uh, council members, obviously, that are that are in the council chambers tonight. Um, I appreciate that uh, that we try to work through this slowly and make sure that I recognize you before you start speaking. 
and please give your name too. Don't expect me to recognize your voice, even though I think I can. But let's make sure that that I that I can recognize that. Anybody want to start the discussion? Anybody want to make a motion? <laughs> I just want to ask Aaron. Will it will it, will the question and answer uh, page that's on our Will that be filed with this resolution to go along with it? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. the question and answer was uh, to give insight into what this meant for both council members and for our residents and businesses, okay. and that would be promoted on our website. It okay. makes things much clearer, so I'm hoping that is good. Okay. Anybody else that would like to speak? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we got here. Dimitri, Dimitri, Martin. Martin. Okay. okay, Dimitri, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've been monitoring all of the emails that were sent in to uh, public input at cityofopaca.org. And um, I, I add up a total of 281 emails. And uh, I just want to share that 63% of those were in favor of the mask resolution. Um, I went through that list of 281 and I attempted to identify which were from the city of Opaca. And then I created a subtotal and 80, uh, there were 77 responses from within the city um, that I were able to identify. 82% um, of those are in favor of the mask resolution. And then I looked at just my by Alder District, District Number Four, representing Wards Four and Six, and there were 38 responses there, 71% uh, in favor of the resolution. I also looked through the, the language of the different emails for and against, um, and I I pinpointed which ones were from medical professionals, doctors, and nurses, and I found 12 that were from medical professionals and all 12 were in favor of a mask uh, resolution. And so I just want to share the, those statistics uh, with the public and with the rest of the council. I have uh, posted those statistics on my Facebook page if anyone wants to uh, see them in greater detail. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Uh, there was somebody else that was trying to speak. Uh, it's Alan. Alan, thank you. Uh, this is alderperson Alan Keelan. Um, I disagree a bit with the uh, with which of the resolutions is more restrictive, and I guess I would like to suggest that we change our resolution to mirror that of the governor's. So, in other words, we put the same sunset date in it and also the masking issue for juveniles, uh, five-year-olds versus four-year-olds. That way, if the governor's order does get overturned, we still have something in place that mirrors what he was trying to accomplish. Okay, uh, Alan, if, if it's okay, can I just respond? I really don't have a response to the, to the difference in the, in the date, you know, uh, whether it's uh, September 28th, I think, versus uh, October 31st. But I do have a response as far as what you call the juvenile age. Uh, the reason that we used four and under is because uh, the school district has come, the Wapak School District has come out with uh, their requirement that uh, uh, 4K th uh, through 12, if they attend the schools, will be required to wear masks. And that's why we chose the four versus the age five. Okay. 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 I understand. All right. Anybody else? The mayor, I would like to speak, please. And, and that's Paul Hagan, I'm assuming? Yes. yes. All right. Thank you. Um, certainly. I, my question is, uh, since this is in resolution form, do we even have the ability to mandate a action or or um, an inaction in a resolution form versus uh, an ordinance form? I can certainly understand if we 
our resolution would be for city buildings and city employees, but for um, non-city properties and businesses, can a resolution be used to mandate mask wearing versus an ordinance? I think that's a great question for Tom Hart. <coughs> Attorney Tom Hart, please. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, and the statute, um, which gives the municipality the power to um, make such declarations does say that local units may declare by ordinance or resolution emergencies. And this is an emergency resolution. So specifically, the statute does say resolution. Okay. okay. Other, com Other comments? Dave Peterson. Dave Peterson. Uh, I've read all the emails and I appreciate everyone from both sides of the aisle. Um, <coughs> some were kept short, just yes or no, and some gave some extra description as to why. I appreciate particularly the one from, I'll just, first name was Ivy and another one from a person named Aaron, E-R-I-N, that I really totally agree with which would be on the negative side. Um, concerned about who would enforce this? Are we putting the enforcement in the hands of the business owners? And apparently it starts there. They have to ask the person to leave, and then if they don't leave, then at least we get called to come and get more of a disorderly type thing. Um, I also agree with Dimitri when he said, the, I, we're not medical experts here by any means. Who knows if we're even right? What we think because things change so fast. Nationally, they change. To read today will be changed in a week from now. So no matter what we decide, we, you know, down the road we'll find out if we did it right or wrong. Uh, but everyone, all the medical side seems to take the yes side. So it's a good thing that way. And because of the uh, 60, 30, 35 percentage, if it was 50 50, I would vote no. Because it's 65, 35, I will vote yes for the resolution. I don't know if we went to a full ordinance, if I would vote for that yet, yes or no. For the resolution, I'll vote yes based on public's input. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Uh, other comments? Anybody? This is Paul again. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Um, our sheriff has sheriff's department has stated that they will not enforce the uh, masking mandates, um, and indeed, um, the vast majority of county sheriffs have also said that. Um, and in our last meeting, um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but the uh, police department stated that they it would just be too much for them to enforce that. Uh, I also read many, many of the emails, and I felt that the folks who were definitely against this had some very valid points, and I still believe that this is governmental overreach. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, Brian, do you want to explain maybe Chief Ozell this actually is uh, that I'm asking? First of all, can you just explain um, how you are going to handle the governor's order in the in the city of Opaca, and then and then just follow it up with uh, if if the if the order was to go away, how would that how would you handle it with the resolution? So first of all, we just want the citizens to know that um, it's important to obviously try to follow the governor's order, but um, unfortunately, our resources are very limited as to what we have for our department with responding to other complaints. Um, we hope that people in the community understand what the issue is. And, you know, for business owners and property owners, you know, we're asking them for voluntary compliance. That's the biggest thing. Um, if there is an issue that does happen in a store, and people do refuse to leave, the police department will respond and we will take the appropriate action that is needed. Um, I mean, the biggest thing that we're looking for is compliance. 
um, there could be a trespassing or disorderly conduct. And I guess the other part is, you know, if people do see people not wearing masks, not to approach them, you know, try, just try to maintain social distancing. There could be a reason why that individual doesn't have a mask on and we don't want to see a confrontation happen. Um, I guess the biggest thing is, you know, all of us trying to work together here. Thanks. And, and quite honestly, whether it's the governor's order or the resolution, it's unchanged how the police department will handle it within the city. That is correct. Anybody else that would like to add anything? Okay, what's on your agenda is the resolution. Uh, you can obviously uh, make a motion to approve. Uh, you can make a motion to table. Uh, you can be inactive. But we need to move forward some way here. So if, if anybody would like to make a motion, I'm uh, make sure you see. Move to approve. Okay, that's Dimitri. Yes. yes. Okay. Second. second. Motion, motion by Martin. A second by Fair that we approve resolution number 1464. This is an emergency face covering requirement during the COVID-19 pandemic. Any further discussion? Sandy will call the roll. Steve, Steve Hackett. Aye. Lori, Lori Chestnut. Aye. Paul, Paul Hagan. No. no. Alan, Alan Keeland. Alan, Alan Keeland. Aye. Scott, Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Aye. Dave, Dave Peterson. Aye. Paul, Paul Mayo. Aye. Dimitri Martin. Aye. Mary, Mary Fair. Aye. And Eric, and Eric Olson. Aye. Aye. Nine, nine ayes. Motion carried. All right. All right. Uh, thank you. Let's uh, move on then. We have uh, uh, some unfinished business from ordinance number 06-2020. Uh, this is an ordinance under the city of Wapaka chapter 2 of the governing body creating section 2.17 this is the removal of disruptive persons at council uh, committee or any other city meetings and aaron you want to just touch on why this is on the agenda and and uh, let us know if you have heard any uh, comments on this ordinance yeah thank you mayor smith uh so as we talked last meeting this is on the agenda um came up a, a couple months ago and we were discussing you know if someone one were to get unruly whether it be a council member or a member of the public or a department head or whatever it may be um you know we would want to continue to run our business whether it be a council meeting or a committee meeting um and we wouldn't want it to disrupt what we were trying to do that night what are our options as far as moving along and removing a person uh, from a council meeting obviously we, we consulted legal counsel because we wanted to make sure we were um, abiding by all open meeting laws the result of that was okay yes you you likely do have you have the authority to do that but you should really administratively have an ordinance that states that so this is a result of that it's an administrative piece um you guys have had a chance to see it now a couple times i have not heard any um comments for or against uh the ordinance um so it is as you see it in front of you and i believe it's on page 74 of your packet um so we'd be looking to, to take action on this tonight all right again as aaron stated this this actually is the second reading of this so we can take action on this tonight if you choose so we'd be looking for a motion to adopt ordinance number 06 2020. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Olson, second by Chestnut that we approve ordinance number 06 2020. Any discussion? Sandy will call the roll. Steve Hackett. Aye. Aye. Lori Chestnut. Aye. Alan Keeland. Aye. Paul Hagan. Aye. Scott Prochatsky. Aye. 
Dave Peterson. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. Dimitri Martin. Aye. Mary, Mary Fair. Aye. And Eric Olson. Aye. Ten eyes. Motion carried. All right, uh, Aaron, thank you. Sandy, thanks. Um, uh, okay, let's go back to non-agenda items and announcements. We have a couple of items under there. First of all, we... So I think Mayor Smith, I think we have resolution 1461 under unfinished business. Oh, is that on the next page? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Justin, you want to... This was the public hearing earlier tonight. Give us your abbreviated, yep. unabridged... Sure thing, Mayor. So starting on page 75 of the packet is the resolution to be adopted tonight for that vacation of Franklin Street in the alleyway in between Granite and Pleasant Street. I think I've uh, described this in length multiple times. If you have any questions, let me know. Thank you. You know, this is one of those items where we wouldn't even know about it if somebody didn't look at the map because... There is no way that you could get a road where there's or an alleyway where they're suggesting to put one on the map. So, Justin, that's as brief as I've ever heard you. Seriously. <laughs> Somebody write that down. <laughs> All right, we need a motion to approve. Move to approve. Resolution 1461. Uh, motion by Fair, second by Keelan, that we approve resolution number 1461. This is our resolution to discontinue uh, the Franklin Street right away in the alleyway from Granite Street to Pleasant Street located at City of Wapaka, Wapaka County, Wisconsin. Discussion? Sandy will call the roll. Steve Hackett? Aye. Aye. Lori Chestnut? Aye. Paul Hagen? Aye. Alan Keeland? Aye. Scott Prochatsky? Aye. Dave Peterson? Aye. Paul Mayo? Aye. Dimitri Martin? Aye. Mary Fair? Aye. And Eric Olson? Aye. Ten ayes. Motion carried. All right. Aaron, Sandy, is it okay if I go back now? All right, thank you. All right, next up, we have uh, non-agenda items and announcements. We have a presentation of a certificate of appreciation to Barb Rober for her 20 years of service to the city of Wapak. I'll just read it real quick here. Uh, this is a certificate of appreciation that certifies that Barb Rober, in recognition of service to the citizens of Wapaka from 828 to 2000 to the present, uh, has been employed by the city. Obviously, we thank Barb for her 20 years of service. 20 years, that's a lot uh, of service. Um, and uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, um, I'll make sure that, or Sandy will make sure that she gets this certificate. We couldn't convince her to show up tonight. All right. Uh, next up, I understand that we have some uh, more public input uh, for tonight. Uh, and so, Chief, uh, if you would, uh, those of you that are in the library meeting room that would like to give additional public input tonight on a non-agenda item, um, we're going to ask you to walk in and stand by the podium, give your name and address for the record, and your discussion will be limited to three minutes or less. I forget to recognize our city staff, but even though um, uh, I see Peg is in here and Justin and Aaron and Sandy, uh, Andrew is meeting with us remotely tonight and so is Kathy, right? Am I missing anybody? Oh, and Chief Ozell's here tonight too, obviously. And Josh. Oh yeah, and Josh is hiding in his area. <laughs> Hi, Mike. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Go ahead. Can, can everybody hear me? We can. Just state okay. your name and address and go for it. Michael Oferoski, 611 North Harrison Street, 
Apartment, Apartment 3, Wapaka, Wapaka Wisconsin. <clears throat> Forgive, Forgive me, I'm nervous. I didn't have anything prepared. <clears throat> I'm just here to talk about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. I don't want to mention the exact incident that happened. But I do want to speak in regards to the march itself. When we first had our initial meeting at the library, it was like a celebration. And it was also respecting those who lost their lives. It's... It's very, it's very disconcerting to me that at that first meeting, gathering at the library, that we had at least three people in front of stores armed, and the group has received threats. So the last March, we had a couple people show up armed. And, and I, personally, personally I'm, not I'm not a, a huge Second, Second Amendment nut. nut. I, I would, would never own a gun. gun. So, so it, 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 it did concern, concern me, me, but the Second, the Second Amendment, Amendment is for everybody and not just, just conservatives. So, so when, it when it comes to the march, to the march and the fact and that... The fact that uh, uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter group has been threatened in the past. People who are anti-Black Lives Matter need to understand that they are not the only ones with Second Amendment rights and that those who are um, pro-Black Lives Matter also have the right to defend themselves. And Wisconsin is an open carry state. So... This has set this has some set people, people off, off. But, but while I am not for carrying, for carrying weapons, weapons in public myself, myself I, do I do understand the concern, the concern that the group had and why two of uh, the marchers and those in attendance did have weapons. Uh, they, were they were never po uh, pointed at anyone. At, excuse me. They were never pointed at anybody that I witnessed. They were. These people were just there. Um, that uh, they had the weapons for protection of the group and self-protection, as there have been threats. So I just wanted to say that. Um, we are not a violent group, and it's just a shame that Black Lives Matter has a triggering effect to some people, where the fact that we're marching for racial equality has the effect to frighten people. Mike, uh, thank you. Uh, sure. You are over your three minutes. But, uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. Yep. yep. Thanks. Thanks. So under our 20 minutes uh, later tonight, uh, number 10, which has to do with issues and project discussion, uh, Marcy uh, Reynolds will be here tonight, and we are going to allow her to just sit in with us as we discuss that. Good evening. Good evening, y'all. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are y'all? Yeah, just give your name and address for the record, please, and and uh, go ahead. My name is Lamont Lewis. I live at E29, 84 Crystal Road, Wapaka. 
I just want to discuss the protest, Black Lives Matter. Um, I lived here for 10 years, and I'm very disappointed in my community. There's a lot of closet racists. Uh, people, have people have been threatening, been threatening some, of the, some of the leaders in the Black Lives Matter that's been going on in Wapaka. <coughs> Excuse me. Just today, just today I worked work for the Wapaka cap. Just today, just today I was called, was called the N word several times. We have, a, we have a huge problem in this community, and for people to be against equality is just ridiculous. And that's why, and that's why we need these protests. Um, I, could be here I could be here all day telling you guys the stuff I've been through. It doesn't matter because it's going to continue. So, so it, it's pretty that's pretty much all I got. I just I want everyone on board to support these protests because we need them. Because there's a lot of people in our community who's who's racist. We have racist cops, and maybe even some of you guys have racist thoughts. I don't know, but we have a problem, a huge problem, and that's it. That's all I got. Hey Lamont, can I? I know this isn't question and answer, but you said something and I didn't quite catch it. You're an employee of, of the taxi cab? Yes, I am. And today I was verbally abused by a passenger today because I asked him to wear a mask and he called me a nigger more than once. Okay. Thank you, Lamont. Thank you. Sorry that happened to you. Yeah, I am too. Hi, I'm Kim Tricky. Um, my address is 163 Northwestern, Northwestern in Nina, Wisconsin. Um, I was here on Saturday for the Black Lives Matter protest, and I have been at several of these protests, and I have never felt so threatened at any protest ever around Wisconsin. Um, we were immediately, immediately met with anger and hate and people giving us the finger and swearing at us. Um, I, w I was quite appalled. I really was. Um, the police force, I felt, did nothing um, as far as protecting us. That is why people came armed this time to help protect us. Um, we had someone attempt to run us over last time we were here. Um, I looked, up I looked up the mission statement, and I believe the police, their mission, their mission statement is to protect and serve and to protect people's rights to have a voice. I'm here because most of the citizens who are part of our movement who live in this vicinity are afraid to come forward and speak. So I'm trying to be a voice for those folks. Um, where, where is our right for freedom of speech? You know, we came to do a peaceful protest. The police had an option. They could protect and serve. They could have been part of our envoy. They could have helped assist us, but they chose not to. They chose to stop us, harass us, and aggravate us. They targeted members of our group. The young man um, that unfortunately was arrested is an autistic young man. So, so when, when the police go to grab him, what is his instinct, instinct, instinct going to be? be? I'm a mental health professional. I know how autistic people respond in a threatening, in a threatening you know, when they are threatened and when they are grabbed physically. Okay. okay. These, officers These officers had a multitude of different ways they could have approached us. I don't know, I don't know if your city has um, done, any done any kind of training. training. Any kind, any kind of, of mental health, health, health training, training, any kind of crisis any training, any kind of de-escalation training, training, but I feel, but I feel like something, else, something is else is needed. So, so I, I don't have much else to say, but I feel like I, I was just I appalled, was just appalled 
that the way that, the way that, that you know, and, you know, and I know for myself, coming back, <laughs> coming back here, here since, then, since they then, they have infiltrated many of our groups on social media, on social media and, they and they have found me and sent me private messages that were threatening. These are, These are people in your community. So do you, so want, do you want to be known as a community that is, that is full of racists? Or do you not want to be considered that in this community? I think you have to look at what you what you want to be remembered as, what you want this community to be seen as. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder to City Planning Commission meeting members uh, that meeting tomorrow night is going to be held 100% virtually. So if you haven't received an invite to that meeting tomorrow, make sure you get one uh, from either Aaron or Josh uh, for tomorrow night's meeting. What time is it? 5.15. 5.15? Yeah, it's our regular okay. Planning Commission meeting. So it should be on his. Uh, calendar. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Can you all hear me okay? We can. We can. All right. All right. My, name My name is Cheyenne Brevoort. I live at 420 Park Avenue, Little Shoot. So I am not a constituent of Wapaka. But I am here because the people in your community do not feel safe here. People brought weapons to a protest because they did not feel safe exercising their First Amendment rights in your community. There was a peaceful protest a week before the events of last Saturday. And protesters were struck by a vehicle, and nothing was done about it. Protesters were threatened with weapons, and nothing was done about it. I participate in protests across the area, and I have not been in Wapaka yet, but I drive in protests to prevent other vehicles from running people over because people are aggressive to people who are peacefully protesting the racial divisiveness, inequality, and injustice that is happening in our communities and across the country. These are legal protests, and the people who showed up with weapons on both sides, counter-protesters and protesters, I assume, I can't speak for the people carrying in their vehicles, were carrying legally and practicing their Second Amendment rights. That woman in here who is advocating for better mental health training by police, by police officers, officers and, how and how you should handle autistic people. people. She is correct. The way, the way that officers handled, handled that situation was, was so aggressive and inappropriate and, inappropriate and, escalating, and escalating of the situation, I cannot, I cannot even begin to describe, describe how that made me feel as a person watching the situation, let alone, let alone a person who was there or being escalated by the police officers who are supposed to be there to keep everybody safe, not just the people that they agree with. And I just think that you need to consider that there are more people in your community than the people who look like you, than the people who are shouting the things that you agree with, and you need to consider that there are people who are afraid to come stand up here, who are afraid of the things they are hearing and seeing in your community. Thank you. Thank you. 
Do I, do I escort myself out? The officer was dealing Hold with a different a situation. Shannon, I just have a quick question for you. Thanks, yes. for, thanks for coming. Um, just wanted to check. Uh, did I hear this right? Did you say you have not been in Wapaka? Yet at a, mm -hmm. at a, I have been in Wapaka, and I have protested with many of the people who were present. I was not present at the event. No. Okay, thanks. I just wanted yeah. to make sure I got that. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, he'll show you all. Chief, is that it? I don't know. I'm going to check. Oh, thank you, sir. There, that is it. Thank you, Thank you Chief. Appreciate it. Okay, okay that was public input. Uh, any, any council members that have any public input uh, for tonight, or staff for that matter, that would like to speak on a on a non-agenda item? All right, let's uh, move on down to new business. Then uh, we got some voting machines that we got to look at, and that's you, Sandy. Uh -huh. um, my um, voting machine um, pages begin on page 79 to 83. The cities for electronic voting machines are or will become obsolete by January 1st of 2023. And the Wapaka County is suggesting that we all, they would like the whole entire county to use the same machines, which is called an ICE, Image Cast Evolution Electronic Voting Machine. Um, so our vendor, Command Central, at this time, if we sign on before the end of August, is offering us a reduced rate. Instead of 8,444 per unit, they will reduce it to 6,060. Which, which, you know, of course, gives the city a, a hefty savings. Um, besides that, the Wapaka County Finance Committee has also approved um, that they will order the machines, pay for the machines, and then allow the city to have a two-year payback if we sign a contract with them. Um, I think it's it's a it's a great it's a great deal. I don't want to miss this. I don't want to wait until you know middle of 2023 and then be scrambling to find something or 2022, excuse me, and then be scrambling to find something that works. So I would my requested action is that um, you allow me to enter into a contract with Command Central to order two new voting machines and then. Um, also enter a con into a contract with Wapaka County to have them pay for it, and we'll pay them the first half in the year 2021 and the second half in the year 2022. So that's my request tonight. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sandy. So, again, uh, it, it makes sense uh, that that we are all on the within the area, obviously, or maybe the whole country has the same kind of machines that uh, you vote with. So it, it, it seems to make a lot of sense to do this. Plus, the county is gracious enough to allow us to pay for this over a two-year period. So uh, all of it seems to make a lot of sense to Sandy, and, and mm -hmm. I, I I agree with that. So um, any questions on that? Anybody would like to make Mayor, a motion? Mayor, uh, Sandy is two enough. 
It is. Actually, Actually the, the county, county suggested, suggested it, so did Command Central, that we only need one okay. for our amount of people. My thoughts are, if we have two, we have a second one for absentees. With the, with the volume of absentee ballots that are coming in, right. especially with the presidential coming up, that we're going to need. Um, okay. okay. Oh, we're not going to have it by the presidential. That's right. But still, for future for future elections, everything's going more absentee than, you, than not. You told me this this afternoon. I guess I wasn't listening as closely, but we presently have four. And, we presently have four. And we're going to two because these are that much more efficient. Oh, right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Very much. Yeah. Okay. We're looking for a motion to approve. So move. So move. Uh, motion by Chestnut, second by Olson, that we purchase two into image cast evolution electronic accessible voting systems and approval of entering into an intergovernment cooperative agreement with Peck County to facilitate purchase of accessible voting systems with repayment of two years for 2021 and 2022 budgets. Uh, first half, it will be payable on January 5th of 2021 and the remaining balance would be paid by January 31st of 2022. Any discussion? Any discussion? Any call roll. Steve Hackett. Aye. Aye. Lori Chestnut. Aye. Paul Hagen. Aye. Alan Keeland. Aye. Aye. Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Dave Peterson. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. Dimitri Martin. Aye. Aye. Mary Fair. Aye. And Eric Olson. Aye. Aye. Ten ayes. Motion carried. Thank you. Sandy, thank you for your work on that. Uh, Josh, are you around? <laughs> Next one has to do with uh, WPAC online. Thank you, Josh. Okay. Um, as we've worked through our WPAC online expansion project in northern WPAC County and western Outagamie County, there's one area we've had trouble getting into up there that's in pretty high need of better internet service. And we've reached out to a number of property owners out there trying to find an existing structure, a silo, or something of the like to use, and we're just not finding the right structure in the right spot with a willing property owner. Um, Ralph and I have been talking to a number of other property owners in that vicinity about the possibility of renting some land to build a tower to uh, help meet some of the needs we're looking at at this area. And we've come across a willing property owner that would allow us to do that uh, with a land lease agreement. Um, as far as uh, the location, this would be east of Manila near the intersections of Highway T and N. And what's uh, very advantageous to us on this area, um, in your packet, past my memo, I've got a copy of the state of Wisconsin broadband map in this portion of B County. And it's one of the most underserved areas in the county as far as internet service goes. We've got a number of calls from this area that we cannot service with our current infrastructure. So we know there's a need up there for internet. Um, another advantage is this is what I'm told is one of the highest points in the county as far as elevation goes. And on the next page in your packet, it kind of shows what the coverage area um, with a tower in this location would look like. And it actually, um, considering line of sight from individual houses, covers quite an expansive area uh, for a, a tower. So um, it meets uh, some needs as far as getting internet. And the other really good thing about this location is it allows us to put in a second path for redundancy and better service up to this whole area in the northern portion of the county that we expand it to. So right now we've got one connection from Wapaka up to this area. A second connection up there would allow us to get more speed up there, um, kind of splitting the load between some areas up there to provide faster and improve service and just to have that redundancy in case one link or the other were to temporarily fail, we could switch everything over to one or another. Um, we've been working with a willing property owner up there, and on a staff level, we've kind of came to an agreement with him on a potential land lease. And some of the highlights on that would be $125 a month, and we'd pay that annually, and we'd provide him with a couple free internet connections as well. Um, the agreement would be in three-year periods with four guaranteed renewal terms. And the reason for that is it provides us some safety. We want to enter something that's long-term. We don't want to invest money in a tower 
and then, and then you know, we, you know, we want that there long term, but we also, but we also want to provide a safety net should at, some, should at some point we want to back out of this for any various reasons that that's built in there. Um, LAPAC Online would cover the cost of the construction and maintenance of the tower. The property owner would provide electric service to us along with 24-7 access. Um, we've got some termination clauses in the proposed land lease that we can terminate uh, with 90 days notice if LAPAC Online were to cease operations. And uh, we can terminate with 90 days notice at any end of any three-year term. Um, if we terminate the agreement, there are a couple options as far as the future of the tower goes. We have right, uh, first right to maintain to remove that tower and reuse it for another use. If uh, online or the city does not want it, we would sell it to the property owner for a dollar if they wish to obtain it for any reason. And if neither of those options are viable, then we'd have the tower removed. The property owner would have some termination clauses in the agreement. Um, they could uh, terminate the agreement if we don't pay the lease, if the, if the tower becomes unsafe or unstable and we don't have it fixed within a reasonable period of time would be um, their termination in there. Um, so what I'm asking for tonight is the city to approve signing the lease and entering the lease agreement with the property owner. We wouldn't actually make any payments on this land lease until the day we break ground. So if we build the tower in two weeks, that's what would trigger making a payment. If for some, reason, For some reason, we just never built this, then this wouldn't go anywhere with any uh, payments. So those are kind of the key, uh, kind of the key highlights of it. Um, the lease agreement is a kind of a combination of the agreement we have with Wapaka County for utilizing one of their towers um, with a mix of some uh, statements from the agreement we have with the city of Wyawega. So most of uh, what's in here is just fairly standard, and we just kind of work through it with the property owner just to kind of meet in the middle with uh, what we were comfortable with recommending on a staff level and what the property owner was agreeable to. Um, the lease has been reviewed by our insurance company and legal counsel, and everything is good at that end. So any questions about this? Yes. Yes. Just one in reading it kind of quickly now, but... Three-year agreement with four guaranteed renewal terms, and about two dots down it says either side can cut it off after at the end of any three. So, so what? So what, what those guaranteed? I may have been misinterpreting a guaranteed four times there. So that's something that's kind of standard in some tower agreements. So we want something long-term. We don't want to spend the money to build a tower for a short period of time. So we want something built in here that we can be on this land long-term. But we, but we want the flexibility if something changes with our situation down the road where we don't need the tower, where something changes with online, we can get out of this agreement without breaking something and having a huge penalty. So it gives us some windows of opportunity to jump out while guaranteeing we can be on that property long term. Does that make sense? I don't know if I, don't know if I explained that well enough. <laughs> Josh, I was just wondering how much is this going to cost and what, how many years for payback? Um, we're looking at the tower. We don't have an exact cost. We're waiting to get approval on this lease and then we'll move in the next step. Very rough estimates. We're looking at fifteen to $20,000. Um, so we're going to start getting quotes. You know, we're not moving forward on talk, getting permits or getting quotes until everything's good with the lease side of things. So we'll have more details soon. And as far as the, the payback goes, it really depends how many customers we serve off of that, how soon it gets paid back. Um, as far as just a budgeting the expense, we've got plenty of cash reserves within WAPAC Online to cover an expense like this. So we've got no issue coming up with the money. I mean... You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised in a year or two if we couldn't have 20 to 30 customers directly connected to this tower in addition to other connections off of it in other areas. So, I mean, I, I don't have an exact answer. The payback as far as customers go, it just it's variable depending upon how many customers we end up connecting to it. But we know it's a pretty viable location. Okay. Josh. Okay. Josh, Josh go ahead. Uh, uh, as, we as we add more, add more customers, customers um, uh, uh, over time, are you keeping an eye on bandwidth? And is that something that's 
Yeah, we're, yeah, we're yeah. keeping an eye on that. We've got a 500 meg symmetrical connection from Spectrum, and maybe at our max uh, peak time, we're maybe barely touching 400 meg of that. Okay. And I'm, and I'm, I'm thinking maybe in the next year or two we'll renegotiate that and hopefully get a gig for better pricing. But yeah, we're keeping an eye okay. definitely on that. Good, good. Yeah. No, I have no complaints personally. So All right. thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, somebody somebody like, to like to make a motion? So move. So move. Motion, motion by Chestnut. Second. Second. Second by, Second by Fair that the council, council approves entering into a land lease agreement between Wapak Online and Bruce Hembrook for the purposes to install a 120 foot tower of internet service for $125 a month payable annually with three free internet connections uh, for, for guaranteed renewal terms with a 7.5% increase per term. Discussion? Discussion. Sandy, call the roll. Steve Hackett. Aye. Lori Chestnut. Aye. Paul Hagen. Aye. Alan Keeland. Aye. Dr. Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Dave Peterson. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. Dimitri Martin. Aye. Aye. Mary, Mary Fair. Aye. And Eric, and Eric Olson. Aye. Ten, ten ayes. Motion carried. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Josh. Uh, next, uh, next up, we have a first reading of an ordinance uh, that's amending our official traffic map uh, in the city of Opaca. So we're going to have Justin explain this to us and remember what you told us before <laughs> yes sir uh, so the ordinance 0720 on page 94 of your packet uh, details the change in the ordinance or excuse me within the traffic map as supported by our ordinance we want to install uh, two 25 mile per hour speed limit signs and add those to our official map Page 95 shows you, I guess, the aerial of where we want to put these uh, signs. So Webster Way and on Rotary Street, both signs are going to be facing southbound, so they would affect northbound traffic as you turned off of commercial and went into that subdivision, uh, sometimes called Eastgate subdivision, sometimes called Cap Services subdivision. Uh, <clears throat> the reason for this is that commercial drive is 35 mile per hour speed limit. All other uh, city streets in the city are 25 unless posted otherwise. Uh, there is no posted signs out there, and this subdivision is uh, seeing a lot of growth. We expect it to be about 70% full, if not more, within the next two to three years. A lot of young families, uh, and coming off the 35 mile per hour speed limit, we need to have that posted to make people aware they need to slow down, number one. And number two, if they don't, uh, it can then be enforced by PD with the signs up and this ordinance being adopted uh, by you, the council. So the, as, if all goes well with this, uh, the next meeting we'll have our second reading and then published in the newspaper August 27th, and that will, will when the, the update will be official and these signs can then be enforced. All right. All right. Thanks, Justin. Anybody have any questions? First reading, this will be at our next council meeting, which is on the 18th of this month. All right. Uh, next up, uh, we have uh, revised personnel policy, and that's Aaron. Thank you, Mayor Smith. This should be fairly quick. Uh, there's a memo on page 96 of your packet that outlines this. Um, it is, uh, if you guys remember back in April, we had the personnel, personnel policy come forward that outlined the uh, FFCRA or the Family's First Coronavirus Sp Response Act. And that was a result of a federal uh, act that was put in place. And we worked with legal at the time and we, we drafted our policy. And the only thing we're looking to revise here is that it's, it basically was created uh, in three silos. Um, one of those silos was emergency responders sick leave pay. Within that silo, we had a different sunset date, and that was kind of based off of some of the conversations we had with legal at the time. I think all of us were hoping that this pandemic uh, probably went a little shorter term than it's going to end up, um, and that was actually a June 15th date. We're just recommending to make a revision 
to equal the other two uh, categories within this policy. That uh, We would move it from June 15th to December 31st of this year. That mirrors the federal act and the other sections, as I mentioned. Um, as you can see, I've attached it to the memo. The only change is in red, and it's not very much. It's right there at the bottom of the last page on page 101. So uh, just making that slight change. We'd be looking for uh, a motion to approve that, or I can answer any questions if you guys have as well. Who is it? Okay. We have a motion by Fair, second by Dimitri. You want to second it? Yep. yep. Second. Second. Uh, to approve uh, the revised personnel policy for the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Any discussion? Sandy, we'll call the roll. Steve Hackett. Aye. Aye. Lori Chestnut. Aye. Paul Hagen. Aye. Alan Keeland. Aye. Aye. Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Aye. Dave Peterson. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. Dimitri Martin. Aye. Mary Fair. Mary Fair. Aye. And Eric Olson. Aye. Ten, ten ayes. Motion carried. All right. Uh, Thank you. Thank uh, you, Aaron, for that. Uh, next up, we have the operator's license, uh, fifth, license report number 1508. Uh, we would need a motion to approve. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Chestnut, uh, second by Peterson, that we approve license report number 1508. This is an operator's license pending payment of any monies owed to the city and also the background checks. Any discussion? This is a voice vote here. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. All right. All right. Uh, next up, then we have our our uh, no action required uh, discussion. This can be thirty minutes or less, um, and this is to talk about the continuation of the Arts Center feasibility update. In action, I'm going to have Aaron introduce our guest tonight, and and. Uh, Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Smith. So we have Marcy Reynolds here tonight. Um, you guys all know Marcy. Uh, just to set it up, if you guys remember, uh, back in this winter, February time period, we had talked about extending the agreement with Mr. Pedrelli with the St. Mary's site. We actually just talked about extending it again at our last council meeting. We've asked Marcy to come and give an update uh, from the arts group on the task force that they've put together and the feasibility study they've been doing on that site. Um, that would possibly lead to uh, um, an arts recreation center um, at the St. Mary's Church. So uh, without anything further, I'll turn it over to Marcy. And I, Marcy, just kind of let me know when I need to continue to scroll through this, okay? Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot, Aaron. You can scroll to the next um, screen. So um, we began this feasibility study um, and then, of course, the, p the pandemic happened. So um, we're kind of getting back on track right now and just wanted to report to you. Um, my brother, Dan Reynolds, as everyone knows, he's my brother. He is um, from Holmes, Holmes Radford Reynolds fundraising um, in St. Louis. And he put this PowerPoint together and it's extremely wordy. <laughs> so I kind of don't feel like reading it to you guys, but I can just tell you what's going on, okay? So um, we did put together um, a vision for the Arts Rec Center, and we put together a task force to do the feasibility study. And it's a, it's a vision is to have a place where children, youth, and adults are welcome to explore and develop their creativity through the arts. It's a catalyst to greater economic development, fostering business growth, and attracting visitors and new residents to Wapaka. So the task force of um, motivated citizens has been meeting, and through their input, we've done a lot of work in this downtime. Um, so in a way, it's one of those pandemic silver linings. Um, so um, what you have in front of you, I think it wasn't, I didn't have it to you in time for the packet, but there's an updated um, case for support. 
And at your leisure, you can look through that, that it really goes into greater detail and it's been sort of evolved from the input that we've gotten from the task force members and from different various people that we've met through along the way, met with along the way. Okay, you can flip to the next. Okay, so the methodology, um, the task force is providing uh, oversight and input into the process, including advice and um, we have letters of invitation and the preliminary case for support, which you're holding in your hands, has already gone out to um, 90 people. So we did get an initial list of over 130, I think, but we kind of narrowed it down to people that we thought um, would be the best advocates or give us the best feedback as to how this um, vision should progress. Um, so Dan has already set, a, set up several um, appointments with people, of course, with the pandemic. Most of the interviews now are going to be done over Zoom or the telephone. He's had really good feedback so far. He's actually conducted some of them as of today. Um, so his priorities include finding out um, really what people think about this vision and if they feel that they would support it or if there is resources in our community to support it, basically what that all says. Um, the purpose of the study then uh, is to basically look at the vision, the need, the market study, the business case, all of that with these 90 people that we've chosen to ask. Um, do we have the necessary ingredients to implement a successful campaign? That's really the bottom line of this feasibility study. And when we first started this project, that was really going to be the only goal is to see if we could raise the funds for this. But what we've learned and experienced through the pandemic, we have to have a plan B and a plan C. Um, we're very, very committed to the vision of the arts rec center, whether it can be done in St. Mary's or not. We want to find out what other options or suggestions people have for this vision. So, so in that respect, the feasibility study has morphed a little bit. Um, we're still pretty excited about St. Mary's, but we do have those backup plans. Our feasibility um, amount that we want to raise is $1.5 million. Okay. Um, as far as um, how they're going to do the study, um, you could read that if you want to, but it has to do with the questions and they're, ra they're weighted. And if anyone's ever taken a sort of a standardized test, you know that different questions have different meanings and different weights. They have a whole like algorithm of how they do these studies to sort of come up with the best and most scientific way to say yay or nay. So they have a benchmark score algorithm and that's what they'll be utilizing for this. Um, the scores are only one factor. They also have a lot of anecdotal information that they'll be getting from the people that they interview. Um, then they'll come up with a report, and that report will give us a really good picture of the pros and cons, perceived strengths and weaknesses of the case for support. Okay, So we're going to learn a lot through this study. So it's not just, a, okay, we can raise the money or not, but it's actually almost like a community development type process that we're going through. Um, so that's another added feature of hiring a fundraising company for anyone who's interested in starting a project. Um, they really offer a lot of insight into what you're trying to do. Okay. Um, and then key elements of the report. So you'll be getting a report when we're all done with this. And um, the report will, I'll just read this part. This section describes development Assets, liabilities, and confirms or suggests redefinition of the intended campaign objectives and goals. So what that means is if it seems like we wouldn't be able to raise $1.5 million, but maybe we'd be able to raise 900000 it's going to give us a sort of a picture of other ways we can accomplish our goal. And that's really important to me personally because I very, very strongly believe that we need an arts center in our town for all of the reasons that you can read in the case study. So I feel very confident that no matter what this report shows us, we're going to be able to move forward and we're going to have the data and the foundation for doing it. Um, so I guess, why don't you skip up to timeline and next steps? So the invitation letters 
to um, set up interviews were mailed July 20th. They're scheduling interviews, and like I said, they've actually done some interviews. Their goal is actually to just complete 30 to 40. So we sent out a lot. Some people will say, I don't want to do it. Um, I don't know if they'll stop at 40. If, if people want to talk, I think they're going to do them all. But the goal to be statistically um, significant and business significant is 30 to 40 interviews. Um, they aim to conclude the interview process by the end of August and early September, and we'll have a final report ready for you guys late September or early October. Story. Sticking to it. Thanks, Marcy. You're welcome. You're welcome. Anybody have any, Anybody have any questions about what we're, doing? what we're doing? Marcy, I have a quick question. Okay. Um, you're, how often are you guys, and sorry if I missed this, how often are you guys meeting uh, as the task force? I know you, the bulk of your work now, um, between now and October, is going to be interviews, but how about that main group? We've we've met, I think, just five times. Now we're meeting on Zoom, of course. Um, we had some opportunities. We've done some field trips, but it turned out that most of the task force members in the end weren't able to go. Um, so we're doing that sort of work as well. We went to the Campanile Center in Manaqua, which is a very similar footprint and model to what we were proposing, and we spent about three hours with the executive director. So that was very, very interesting. They shared a lot of important data with us in terms of costs of running a building and insurance and all that kind of stuff and programming. We also met with um, a pottery studio because we want to have a potter, pottery maker space, and we really learned a lot about that <laughs> and the physical plant needs to be able to actually do that. So that was interesting. We've met with um, Ann Katz from Arts Wisconsin. We're going to be meeting with the Wisconsin Arts Board. We're going to be meeting with the YMCA. We met with the superintendent of schools. So various members of the task force have been involved in some of those meetings. Um, but they don't really want to meet a lot. They want to just see the work get done. So now we're really pretty much waiting for the results to come in, and then we'll meet again to review the results and look at the report. Awesome. Um, and I know you've done an awesome, you've been gracious enough to include me in on some of those. Yeah. Do you yeah. have another large group meeting? Do you mind inviting me? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I love it when people want to come to our meetings. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Questions? Anything? Oh, this is. Uh, Thank you. Twice in one night, first Justin and now Marcy. So, <laughs> they also have a story they want to tell. <laughs> okay, uh, next up, uh, we have uh, communications recommendations of the mayor. Um, I've had some discussion with Aaron, and, and uh, we'll continue to have discussions before the August 18th meeting, but uh, we are discussing the concept of, of uh, going back to virtual, complete virtual meetings for the city council meetings uh, for at least the next 60 days or so. So we'll have that discussion. We'll let you know in the, in the near future what our decision is on that. Uh, but uh, uh, there's some pros and cons to it. Uh, and right now my feeling is the pros outweigh the cons of doing it virtually completely. So we'll, we'll, we'll just discuss it and we'll see what happens in the future, just to warn you in advance. Uh, anything else for the good of the meeting tonight? Uh, we'd be looking for a motion to adjourn. Motion by Hagen, second by Keelan that we adjourn till our next regular scheduled meeting, which is set for Tuesday, August 18, 2020, subject to call. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you, everybody, uh, for the attendance tonight and attending. Uh, good meeting. Appreciate uh, all your efforts. Have a great night. Go Brewers. Thank you. Uh, we're